Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon your time zone. My name is Freedom Kaya Phillips, and I am the Operations Director for the Centre for International Sustainable Development Law. I would like to welcome you to this conference entitled Climate Change, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Law in the Context of Pandemic Recovery. I will be acting as one of your MCs for this wonderful event. I'd like to hand the floor to my colleague, Antoinette, Nestor, who would be able to provide an introduction as well. Thank you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever in the world you are. Thank you very much for joining us on this wonderful conference. My name is Marie Antonietta Nestor, or Antoinette, and I'm a CSLDL um, Associate Fellow and also a postdoctoral research associate at Lucy Cavendish College. And it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce Professor Marie Claire Cordonier-Seger. Thank you very much, Freedom Kai and Antoinette. And hello. It's a pleasure to be chairing the opening of this Climate Law and Public Policy Conference here in the University of Cambridge in collaboration with our co-hosts in the universities of Glasgow and Strathclyde as an international academic preparatory event for the upcoming Climate Law and Governance Day 2021 Global Symposium that will be taking place in Glasgow next week during the 26th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is also, as we all know, a meeting of the parties of the Paris Agreement. As we open this online event, all our countries are facing critical global challenges which will define the next decades, perhaps centuries of our civilizations on this earth. The risks are real and the science which interprets them is well recognized. For years, even as globalization gained speed, delivering equivocal benefits to millions, we have also been warned of emerging vulnerabilities. Our students have joined scientists and many others, including many of our own children in climate action circles, including the UNFCCC regime. They've underscored the risks and realities of a global climate crisis, extreme weather events increasing, glaciers melting, sea levels rising, corals bleaching, droughts and desertification spreading famine. Humanity's capacity to adopt and implement sustainable energies, carbon negative infrastructure, technology and lifestyle transformations and nature-based solutions in time is still very far from certain. When countries celebrated the passage of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change under the UN Framework Convention in December 2015 in Paris, France, and indeed Climate Law and Governance Day was there at the Sorbonne hosting an event alongside. And its rapid entry into force a year later in Marrakesh, Morocco, a certain sense of constrained optimism permeated the plans of government authorities, international organizations, and business communities, even in academic and civil society circles. Nearly, well, more than five years have passed since Paris, however, and while the grand majority of signatories have embarked with the determination on the difficult tasks of designing and registering their nationally determined contributions and mobilizing domestic reforms, discovering both pitfalls and plateaus, national experiences to date offer both cause for optimism and also increasingly profound concern. In part, this is because implementation of the Paris Agreement is not just an environmental or economic challenge, it is a development challenge, responding directly to all of the world's sustainable development goals. The 17 SDGs and their 169 associated targets recognized in SDG 13 on climate change that the UN Framework Convention is a key forum to coordinate global responses. Across the SDGs, ambitious targets also relate to zero hunger, good health and well-being, life below water and on land, and many others, especially SDG 4 on quality education and SDG 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions, which is important for public policy. The SDGs may be soft law, aspirational voluntary targets adopted to facilitate more coordinated international and domestic action, but vast networks of binding international treaties and organizations, including the UNFCCC and its Paris Agreement, and also implementing entities such as the Green Climate Fund. At this moment of equal crucial importance, 
myriad national, local, regulatory bodies across all spheres of human activities are struggling to meet each target, just as we struggle to implement the Paris Agreement. As we open this international conference with nearly, actually over 800 registrants from more than 110 countries, and indeed, as we launch an entire global program of linked COP26 climate law and governance initiative events, co-hosted with over 200 partners, we face a sobering reality, one worthy, one that depends on and requires and demands new research, new teaching, and new action on all levels. Civilization has reached a crossroads. The global economy, nature, and humanity depend on what is currently ambivalent capacity for compliance with our climate commitments. At present, in spite of a Cambridge study, which has shown that 169 of 186 nationally determined contributions explicitly prioritize legal and institutional reforms in their plans to contribute to the global response to climate change, it remains unclear whether domestic law and public policy could actually be described as part of the problem or part of the solution in this struggle. That's partly because law and public policy reform may be a priority in NDCs, but advancing the scholarship and the capacity needed to achieve higher ambition on climate change remains an ongoing challenge. Effective, accountable national and international law on sustainable development, especially to support Paris Agreement implementation, has never been more important, especially as countries struggle to set measures in place to speed economic recovery from the global COVID-19 pandemic. As we shall discuss in this conference, studies have identified over 1,800 laws and policies set in place to address climate change, and there is a great deal to be learned from recent innovations. More diverse, carefully tailored public policy and legal measures are needed to address widely differing national circumstances and to move towards a net zero economy, especially in the context of post-pandemic economic stimulus. This conference, in partnership with the world's leading academic publishers, law and policy journals, and many, many marvelous institutions, as well as a broad base of volunteers who have worked tirelessly for many months, is a contribution to global efforts to bridge the current knowledge and scholarship gaps. Further, despite progress both internationally in advancing post-Paris ambition and nationally and locally to develop climate responses, there remain critical capacity limitations to effective implementation of the Paris Agreement in a manner that secures the world's sustainable development goals. The enormity of this challenge for all disciplines and professions, especially for law and public policy, is clear. With 167 UN UNCCC parties requiring urgent legal and institutional reform to implement their commitments, and only a few paltry qualified lawyers, among them many of those you will meet in this series of upcoming events, available to assist in each country, a capacity chasm is gaping in our path ahead. As the world and the UK open the decisive 26th Conference of the Parties this Monday, which will focus on implementation challenges above all, more capacity is needed across all fields and professions, especially law and public policy. The world's best universities and institutes, our teachers, our students, indeed, our heads of leading departments, our journals, our law and public policy societies, leading firms and associations of practitioners, our academic press presses, indeed, all of us are needed. In each country and region of the world, hundreds, perhaps thousands of capable informed jurors specialized in climate change are required to bridge the gaping chasm. The best and brightest of our law and public policy students from all countries and the world's leading centers of education and research face a critical opportunity to make a decisive contribution to the highest possible ambition in our global response to climate change. We are joined here today by some of those leaders, particularly through video, our vice chancellor himself, and also especially some of the faculties that have come together to assist us in hosting and making this conference possible. And indeed, who have worked tirelessly over the years in the research and the teaching and the action to help to work 
toward a solution to climate change. So without further initial remarks, I would like to turn over the floor to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Stephen Toop, and then to uh, Professor Bhaskar Vera, the head of our Department of Geography, Professor David Howarth, the head of our Land Economy Department, Professor Diane Coyle, who of course co-directs the Bennett Institute for Public Policy and is here also for our Politics Department, as well as Dr. Marcus Gehring, who directs the Center for European Legal Studies and is also a member of the Laudapak Center for International Law in our law faculty here in Cambridge. Please, Freedom Kai, if you'd like to cue Professor Stephen Toop's remarks. Distinguished guests, it's my privilege to welcome you on behalf of the University of Cambridge to a very special series of international events on law and governance related to climate change. As the United Kingdom prepares for COP26, we're honoured to co-host the academic pre-conference event on climate change, the SDGs and the law, as well as the Climate Law and Governance Day during COP itself. Together with our partners, the University of Glasgow and Strathclyde University. As leading international negotiators, practitioners, experts and scholars and students from around the world prepare to meet in Glasgow for the most consequential climate talks of recent years, I'm delighted that our university can step up to promote scholarly dialogue, to find new solutions and especially to help educate present and future generations of leaders. The challenge of raising climate ambition while ensuring a rapid and equitable pandemic recovery is both urgent and daunting. While the start of COP26 is a cause for celebration, there's no margin for error in Glasgow. Climate heating effects are already destabilizing communities, economies, and ecosystems. Meanwhile, the continuing COVID-19 pandemic sparing no country, continues to test our healthcare systems as the global death toll surpasses an unimaginable 4.5 million people. With the world on a trajectory of catastrophic heating that will only exacerbate inequalities, a drastic course correction is needed. The choice is clear. We can rethink the unsustainable norms and practices ingrained within our social and economic models or submit to the justice challenge of our century. As these critical next weeks will highlight, legal tools and governance frameworks at local, national, and international levels provide both obstacles and opportunities in responding to climate challenges. Now more than ever, there's a need to build collaborations and amplify ideas that advance the implementation of the Paris Agreement and the Global Sustainable Development Goals. To this end, universities must embrace our decisive role in accelerating the development of law and policy innovation. We must do this while empowering actors across sectors and levels of government to understand, shape, and leverage the role of law in climate mitigation, finance, adaptation, and resilience. Through events like these, I am proud that the University of Cambridge, in lockstep with our hundreds of COP26 partners, stands firm in its commitment to fostering bold climate solutions. I'm hopeful that our efforts will support a growing community of practice in this field, yielding pivotal solutions for sustained climate action well beyond COP26. I want to extend my special congratulations to the committed Cambridge, Glasgow, and Strathclyde scholars and student volunteers. I'm deeply encouraged and inspired by your work. We must put the voices of young people at the center of discussions and decisions about the future that they will inherit. I must also congratulate the diverse interdisciplinary body of professors, scholars, practitioners, and experts joining us in all aspects of this program, as well as the numerous partners in the UK and worldwide, including the Leverhulme Trust, who generously contributed to this event. In closing, I want to reflect on the fact that all participants today, as well as those participating over the next few days and during COP, are powerful agents, not passive bystanders. 
we each play an important role in facilitating a much needed exchange of knowledge and in helping to strengthen legal capacity on climate change. Your engagement today is implementing the Paris Agreement. I invite all of us to capitalize on this opportunity to imagine the law and policy contours of a better world for future generations. Thank you. That is certainly an inspiring start to our conference. And building on to that start, I would like to especially invite the head of our Department of Geography, Professor Bhaskar Vera. Uh, thank you very much, Marie Claire, and thank you to the organizers and uh, everyone involved in this meeting for inviting me to join you. Um, I think our Vice Chancellor has put it very well, but uh, if I could just reiterate his message which is about the importance of the issues that are being discussed at this conference, the intersection of climate change, the sustainable development goals and the law is really a critical area for us here at the Department of Geography. Um, it intersects very closely with a department that has a deep commitment to the intersection across the physical sciences, the social sciences and the arts and humanities. And I think that interdisciplinarity is really reflected in the very rich agenda that is uh, visible as part of this conference. I'm delighted to be here at the start and I'm deeply regretting that my diary doesn't allow me to be here throughout the conference, um, but I do hope that the deliberations will be both productive, meaningful, and will do what they intend to, which is to really contribute to an important global agenda. As a department that is deeply committed to both our educational and research mission, these discussions are vital. Over these last few months, we have been finding ways to support and amplify the voices of our students who represent in a very real and present way, the future generations that will inherit the planet that my generation will leave behind. That is critical to our educational mission and it is wonderful to have such a mobilized group of students who are so keen to work on these issues. Our research is committed to using knowledge collaboratively for public purpose. And I think this conference represents the best of that tr tradition. Uh, I think I just want to wish you and all the delegates all the very best for this meeting. I'm grateful for all that you're doing and I wish you a very successful meeting indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bhaskar, for joining us and also for everything that your department has done, not the least to help support this conference and all of the related activities. I would now like to introduce Professor David Haworth, who is the head of the Department of Land Economy and has, of course, been working tirelessly on these issues for many years. Thank you, Mary Claire, um, and thank you uh, to all the organizers, to Marcus, to Freedom Kai, and everyone else uh, for um, putting this extraordinary program together. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone on behalf of the Department of Land Economy here in Cambridge. Uh, climate policy and climate law is at the very heart of, of what we do. And um, as proof of that, it's very good to see our staff very well represented in the conference program including many members of our Centre for Environment, Energy and Nat Nat Natural Resource Governance. Um, oh, and of course, Marcus and Marie Claire uh, yourselves, because we, um, uh, we count you as adopted members of our department. Uh, but also um, other people, uh, including um, the, our newest recruit, uh, Dr. Emily Webster, who joined us only last month and we were presenting in the conference. Uh, she's joined us uh, teaching on our MPhil in environmental policy as, long, as well as in our, our law courses. And, um, and we hope uh, very much that our, our next addition to our team will be uh, in the field of climate law itself. Um, and it's also very good looking down the program to see Ron Zimmern on the program, who's a very great supporter of climate law and policy here at Cambridge. Um, just one word on the program itself, if I may. I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that there's a session being devoted to what commercial lawyers can contribute 
to the fight against climate change. Um, as some of you might know, I'm very interested in, in transactions law, transactions lawyers, and how they work, and the similarities between what they do and what, for example, engineers do and other designers. Um, litigation has its place. It's, um, it's, it's great also that the conference uh, is being kicked off by, by a, a very senior judge, um, but a lot depends on the integration of climate goals into the work of the 80% of lawyers who work on transactions and who don't work on litigation. Um, ultimately, a green economy rests on green contracts, on green company structures, green financial instruments, green investment vehicles. And for that, we need green transaction lawyers. So very many thanks for putting that onto the program and the best of luck with the whole of the conference. I'm sure it's gonna be a great success. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will admit to a personal research fascination with transactions as well, partly just due to my own research interest in trade and investment, um, domestic and international. But over time, convinced by others, I've started to look more carefully at how exactly that can be done. And I think many people here in this conference are going to be inspired by some of the beginning research that is being presented on these, these, these issues. And it's a particularly fitting thing, fitting thing to be doing here in Cambridge, next to the city of London and the UK hosting our finance call. I would like to now turn to Professor Diane Coyle um, as co-director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, which has been one of my wonderful seats here in Cambridge, um, together with Land Economy and other colleagues from CCI and Law during the Leverhulme Professorship. Please, Diane. Thank you very much, Mary Claire. I'm already feeling quite inspired actually by all my colleagues' remarks and also by the number of people who've registered to attend and take part in this conference. I um, want to add my warm welcome to everybody who's, who's taking part. And um, I don't want to repeat what others have said. So I think I'll emphasize the point about inter interdisciplinarity that our, our vice chancellor picked on as well. The Bennett Institute has, is now about three years old and was an important initiative by the university to address big problems like climate or biodiversity uh, and all of the others facing our societies and interacting in complex ways and requiring the efforts of researchers, um, but also people in worlds of policy, people in business to, um, to tackle them. It's been a, a, a real pleasure and an honor to host uh, Mary Claire during her Leverhulme professorship. And to be able to add the insights from law to our team of economists, political scientists, engineers, thinking about policies for sustainability and engagement with people from business and, and people from the worlds of policy around, around the whole world. I think this is going to be a fascinating event and it's also going to be an incredibly inspiring event, inspiring us to think, inspiring research, but also inspiring us to action, um, I, I think and hope. This is, as Bhaskar said, a critical time, and we need to bring to bear all the tools that we possibly can to address these challenges facing us. So I'm looking forward to the rest of it, and um, we'll now hand over back to you, Mary Claire. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to now, of course, introduce our colleague from the Faculty of Law, uh, Dr. Marcus Gehring. Thank you very much, Mary Clara. As director for, uh, of the Center for European Legal Studies, CELS, and as a fellow of the Lausbach Center for International Law and a member of the law faculty, I welcome all the participants uh, as uh, David already said, uh, climate law and governance is going to be a key challenge for any legal professional of the future. So in, it is our mandate to educate future generations of lawyers, legal professionals, uh, people with legal backgrounds, and we need to um, invest in this very important area of climate law, we need to train the next generation uh, of lawyers, not just private lawyers, 
not just public lawyers, not just international lawyers in the understanding of the magnitude of the climate challenge. We need all our colleagues from the natural sciences, from Cambridge Zero, from the Bennett Institute, the Department of Geography, the Department of Land Economy, to help us understand what exactly the legal rules are that this coming generation needs. And um, I'm happy to say that uh, as someone who focuses on international and European law, there are many good signs of um, a green turn uh, and, and revolution in the law in those fields, but it needs to trickle down to all areas of legal practice. And that's why events like these are so important. Thank you very much, Marie Claire. And uh, I'm also, I've also been asked to convey the warmest welcome of uh, the chair and the deputy chair of the law faculty. Thank you very much. And I know that Marcus um, has, has some rather important roles to play throughout the conference. Um, and, and, and so uh, he will be back shortly to be able to chair some of the leading sessions, um, not the least the one on international law tomorrow. Um, we are joined by some incredible leaders in this field each of whom is playing a very special role in the COP26, in the UK's preparations to host as our president, the meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement, as well as to the Framework Convention on Climate Change itself. And we're deeply honored to have them here with us. I would like to, for everyone, just introduce one of our colleagues who will be co-chairing with me the concluding um, uh, session of this conference and has kindly joined us um, on the opening, um, Advocate Ayman Jerkawi. He was an extremely um, active um, host for all of us in Morocco in one of the previous Climate Law and Governance Days and indeed in organizing and hosting an incredibly successful COP22 just during some rather momentous um, uh, uh, U.S. elections, among other changing political circumstances. And the work that he, together with his king and his government, did to keep the COP on track in that very difficult time bears special um, recognition. So together with Ayman, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our last few substantive opening speakers for this conference. We are exactly on time. So I'm very, very pleased to be able to give them at least five minutes each. And then we will end at five minutes to the hour to allow everyone to get right into the actual substantive sessions. Um, I would like to first start, of course, by welcoming Lord Robert Carnwath, who not only has many very distinguished associations here in Cambridge, not the least as an Emeritus Fellow at Trinity College, and um, also, of course, um, uh, many connections at the University of London and at the LSE as a professor of practice um, in, in the Grantham Institute, as well as being, of course, a lawyer of landmark chambers. Um, Lord Robert Carnworth, of course, is also, as uh, was alluded to earlier by our colleagues, um, one of our most senior judges, having just stepped down from the UK Supreme Court. Um, Lord Robert Carnworth, would you like to say a few words? Well, thank you, Mary Claire. I feel rather humbled by all that's been said so far. I'm not sure I'm really living up to this. I, um, it's a great honor to be included in this uh, very important event. And the link with Cambridge is particularly important to me. I was a student back in the 60s. Uh, I started law then. Um, I don't think environmental law had been invented then. So it's been a, quite an interesting path. It's really, I think, not to all the Stockholm conference in 1972 that the sort of framework of modern environmental law um, began to be established. Uh, uh, now, I myself, I've always had an interest in environmental law as a practitioner and as a judge, but I became more interested in issues of climate change in around 1997 when I was invited to give a lecture in Malaysia uh, in a series in honor of the great 
former Chief Justice Sultan Aslan Shah, and I took as my subject environmental law in a global society. And um, I, in that, I highlighted the, the very real issues of climate change. But I also quoted some words of uh, Sultan Aslan Shah himself, which I think are very apt to, the, to this current debate. He said this, legal principles and rules help convert our knowledge of what needs to be done into binding rules that govern human behavior. Law is the bridge between scientific knowledge and political action. And I think that's something that I've felt more and more the importance of as the debate has continued. In 2015, I helped to organize a conference in London on climate change and the law. And we brought together a number of speakers from different parts of the world, including senior judges. And we tried to see how ahead of the Paris conference, how the law was gonna play its role in trying to bring the sort of scientific and political con consensus into the framework of binding legal rules. Now, um, since then, um, I've watched with enormous interest the way in which courts around the world have been able to develop principles. And I think it's, I mean, in fact, in 2015, we had something of a landmark case, which was the first agenda case in the Netherlands, which was the first significant case to hold government to account for failing to, to meet its climate change commitments. And we also had the Leghari case in Pakistan, which was a very important and interesting case of the, the courts taking a positive role in ensuring that the governments lived up to their commitments. And that's been the pattern ever since. I think, um, I mean, even in the Trump years, which might have been thought to be a, a big setback and no doubt were, um, it's interesting how the court activity um, continued and in particular the courts really established that the debate about um, climate change and the reality of climate change was really no longer debate. A um, number of young people bringing a case against the government for failure to um, implement the necessary action. That um, found its way to the Federal Court of Appeals during the Trump period. Uh, and what was interesting, I think, about it, although the court eventually decided, certainly as at present, that um, this is not something which is for the courts as opposed to the government, even the Trump administration was unable to put up any serious evidence that climate change wasn't a reality. Uh, and I think it's worth quoting what the majority judge uh, said about it, Judge Herbert, he said, a substantial evidentiary record documents that the federal government has long promoted fossil fuel use, despite knowing that it can cause catastrophic climate change and that failure to change existing policy may hasten an environmental apocalypse. Now, <laughs> That, that was on the unchallenged evidence. And so there really isn't any debate further about that. Um, and as we move forward um, with COP26 and on the, the um, that's come out of COP, uh, and we hope there will be a proper ratcheting up of what we got in um, Paris, then I think they will need to be put into effect by national measures and enforced by national courts. And so I think um, we have, we're moving to the stage where there will be acknowledged by the courts around the world that um, effective action on climate change is a human right, a fundamental constitutional responsibility of governments everywhere and a consensus of that each, each country and each jurisdiction will have to decide how to use its own laws to give effect to that. But I think that legal underpinning is going to be very important. 
So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very pleased to see all these issues being debated so fully in the course of this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you especially for that quite clear quote from one of our leading courts, which I think expresses the urgency and the importance of these issues we face um, in, a, in an extremely helpful way. I'd like to now invite advocate Douglas Lees, who is general counsel of the Green Climate Fund, as well as having served as solicitor general of his country and in many other distinguished roles previous to join us. And he is of course now nearing late evening in um, his current time zone. So a special thanks to him for being with us here in Cambridge tonight. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Marie, and uh, good evening to everybody, Master Ceremonies, uh, distinguished guests. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure for me to be addressing this August body uh, this afternoon. And I want to begin by repeating the obvious that climate change is accelerating. Its impacts is materializing at a pace faster than we are expected, and we are experiencing this in great uh, gradations across the world. I will not repeat the dire warnings which we will hear in the next 14 days on beyond. I think the IPCC report speaks for itself. The simple fact is that we are not on track to achieve the Paris Agreement goals. Global GHG emissions dropped because of the COVID-19 pandemic last year, but the decline was not nearly enough to halt the greenhouse gases, the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The planet has already warmed to 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, and we desperately need to commit to the goals and spirit of the Paris Agreement and to aggressively cut greenhouse gas emissions. This may seem like an insurmountable task when we factor in the various interests at stake. However, I remain optimistic. And my optimistic is driven in large part by the role that a legal profession can play in helping the world to achieve these goals. I use this opportunity to remind us that we have gone down a similar path before. The world came perilously close to causing irreversible damage to the ozone layer caused by the emission of predominantly chlorofluorocarbons, popularly known as CFCs and other greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere. This was avoided by the Montreal Protocol. Albeit reversing the effects of climate change was not the direct goal of the Montreal Protocol. Climate change has benefited from that agreement. A new study has shown that one of the indirect benefits of the Montreal Protocol and its ban on CFCs was that it reduced the strain that ultraviolet radiation puts on plants, inhibiting photosynthesis and slowing growth. The Montreal Protocol avoided a devastation of most of the Earth's most forests and most prime agricultural lands that would have added hundreds of billions of tons of carbon to the atmosphere. The point being made here is that it was international cooperation that resulting in us saving the environment, thus preventing what would have been or what would have resulted in worse global warming than we are witnessing today. When it was discovered that CFCs, CFCs contributed to the depletion of the ozone layer, dozens of countries came together to face the collective threat to the environment and human health. The Montreal Protocol was adopted in 1987 and was finally ratified by 196 nations, agreeing that the phase out of substances that deplete the ozone the ozone layer by imposing strict rules on the signatory, signatories. As a result, the ozone hole is now slowly recovering. This was not the only effect. Many of the chemicals banned with the Montreal Protocol are also greenhouse gases, meaning that their reduction may have prevented more severe global warming. This ban was not well received by the industries reliant on CFCs as they lack viable alternatives then. However, the regulator restrictions forced on them innovation and to find safer substitutes, setting an important precedent for today. 
This is where we as members of the legal fraternity can play a leading role by forcing governments to develop and implement regulations prohibiting and restricting GHG emissions, thereby forcing technology to adapt. We as lawyers have an important role to play in providing our legislators and policymakers with the critical tools that they need to ensure that we achieve the SDGs and the Paris Agreement goals. Instead of waiting for technological developments, making the green transition affordable, the legal fraternity in our respective countries should develop strict rules addressing climate change, effectively forcing industries to find climate friendly solutions. We should demand that our policymakers and legislators put them in force. This was the experience of the Montreal Protocol, and it is my wish that the spirit of Montreal descends on COP26 and enlighten our leaders that procrastination and tinkering is no longer an option. This is why a conference such as this one, sponsored by the universities of Cambridge, Glasgow, Strathclyde, plays an important role in spearheading the movement to help us achieve the SDGs and the Paris Agreement goals. I wish the conference the very best and every success. Thank you. Warmest of thanks to you, Douglas. You've been a key member and indeed judge, not just for this conference with many papers that you are currently judging for us, I understand, and have been ranking all summer, but also throughout the Climate Law and Governance Initiative. And your engagement has been incredibly important to us particularly given your own background from a small island developing state. I think you understand as well as anyone here or more how desperately urgent these questions are and your remarks have reflected that. I would like to now invite Emily Farnworth, who of course is one of the leaders of Cambridge Zero Policy Forum here in the University of Cambridge um, to just say a few words of welcome for us. Thank you very much, Mary Claire, and it's just wonderful to, to hear from all these incredible um, speakers. Um, as you've said, my, my name's Emily Farnworth. I'm um, one of the co-chairs of the Cambridge Zero Policy Forum, which is a multidisciplinary uh, space for academics across the university to come together and talk about some of the critical issues that we need to deal with around climate action. I'm also co-director of the Centre for Climate Engagement based in Hughes Hall, where we have a particular interest in working with chairs and non-executive directors of businesses to make sure that they're aware of both the increasing regulatory environment that's relevant to them, but also recognising the important trend that we see of duty of care of directors changing all the time as we understand the worsening effects of, of climate change. I think as we're going into COP26, it's a time for us to reflect on both where we've come from and how much progress we've made, recognizing that we're not anywhere near we, where we need to get to today, but understanding that there is a lot of hope for speeding up technology in order to deliver what we need to, to get to net zero degrees by 2050 or well before. We're gonna see a lot of new commitments coming from the business community. As we know, although the Conference of the Parties is very much focused on national governments stepping forward with increasing their commitments through their nationally determined contributions, the non-state actors are part of a race to zero and a race to resilience and will be showing their support for voluntary agreements, voluntary action, voluntary commitments to do more and to do more faster. But ultimately, whilst voluntary, re voluntary regulations and vo rather voluntary um, commitments are very helpful and can really send a signal to governments about the speed of change that they want to see, we absolutely need regulation to drive the change faster and further. Whilst voluntary action is, is great, we really need regulation to make it happen and to make it happen at the speed that we need. So I'm personally looking forward to hearing the latest developments from this conference heading into Glasgow next week too and working with both my colleagues across the university, also across many other universities, but also with the external board communities to sort of help them understand and drive change faster. Thank you very much, Mary Claire. Thank you very much, Emily, and thank you for the incredible work 
that not only um, our colleagues all across the university are doing and, and uniting under the banner of Cambridge Zero Policy Forum, but also especially the work that you do in the Hughes Hall Centre for Climate Change Engagement, which is truly remarkable, as well as, of course, through the global initiatives that you are co-leading, um, such as the Climate Governance Initiative and the Chapter Zero with, with our corporate colleagues. And uh, I, I think um, the final opening speaker for this plenary actually needs very little introduction. I will say that she has been a family friend for many, many years. And I have watched with awe and admiration as her work on climate change, not just as a negotiator, not just as a professor of international law at the University of Oslo, but indeed in and through international organizations, not the least now as co-chair of the Paris Agreements Implementation and Compliance Committee, as well as our new chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law, on which many of us here serve and have served for many years, um, has skyrocketed. So um, Christina, thank you for stepping up to the challenge. And without further ado, I hand you to our final opening speaker, Professor Christina Boyd. Thank you so much, uh, Marie-Claire. Um, thank you for your kind words, but thank you also, Marie-Claire, for your unfaltering leadership, for your leadership in this field, for your leadership in bringing us all together several times a year, and also for pushing the envelope, for pushing the dialogue, which is so important, as we've already heard from the previous speakers. Now, it is, of course, with great pleasure to uh, um, be uh, here and to congratulate on behalf of the IOCN World Commission on Environmental Law, the organizers of this conference, the Center for International Sustainable Development Law, and the universities of Cambridge, Strathclyde, and Glasgow, and the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, um, on this important international conference. The conference takes place at the eve of the Glasgow Climate Summit, as we already heard several times. And I think this is a very opportune moment to talk about the role of law in addressing climate change. And we already heard some speakers talk about it. I think the role of law cannot be overemphasized. We do know that we are already entering or we already have entered, entered what's called the critical decade the critical decade until 2030, which gives us the window of opportunity to bring about the transformative changes that are necessary to bring the world on a sustainable path. And I dare say we have entered the critical decade of climate law. And I just want to highlight three points in this critical role of law. The first one is the crucial role of legislation and regulation, as Emily also just alluded to. We need laws, we need regulations to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement, not just the temperature goals, also the adaptation goal, the finance goal. Here, government interventions are absolutely necessary to regulate behavior. And as uh, Lord Kahn was said, law is a bridge between scientific knowledge, which we now have, and actual behavior on the ground. So we need laws and regulations to create incentives through subsidies or tax reliefs or whatever we have, but also to create disincentives, to create standards, to create regulations, but even operate with fines and criminalization. We need the whole toolbox of legal regulation and regulations have to be effective and they have to be just and fair. And they have to cover all sectors, as Professor Markus Gehring said. They have to cover transport, energy, trade and investment, agriculture, the financial sector, building sector, everything we do. And difficult choices will have to be made. We shouldn't fool ourselves. But also here, laws play a very important role. And the time horizon for the impacts of our decisions has to be expanded, to be intertemporal, and to take into account the interests of those that are young today and those that are not even born yet. 
The second point I wanted to highlight about the crucial role, role of law is the role of stakeholders, stakeholder participation, which has to be effective, the inclusion in decision making and access to justice, because the challenge that we are facing is so huge that we can only address it through an all of society approach. And this must include businesses, corporations, financial, commercial sectors, and so forth. It must include indigenous peoples, local communities. It must include workers and vulnerable communities like migrants, people with disabilities. And it must include the youth and children. And finally, the role of the judiciary. That is the third pillar of power. And where science is clear, but action and inaction or insufficient action actually leads to the infringement of rights, in particular human rights, or is otherwise unlawful, then there is a role of courts. And we've already heard and we see that courts are recognizing their roles um, in holding governments, corporations, and even individuals accountable. So all of that just speaks to the crucial role of law in addressing climate change. And with that, I wish you all the best with this conference. It is a great pleasure for the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, for me, myself personally, to be here and to be partnering with you. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussions today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Christina. And I would like to thank all of our opening speakers for staying to time and for expressing these words of encouragement and also for the work that you're doing on the ground with your students, with your communities, and frankly, many of you also with the global community and our, our indeed entire sectors of society whose contributions to climate change are crucial. Action in all of these areas, intergovernmental business, our academia, and across the world is the difference between fostering or frustrating the urgent goals that we have to action now. Speaking of actioning, we are going to have a very rich agenda for you, and we're going to plunge straight into it in the next couple of minutes. I'd like to just highlight especially a couple of key features of how the conference itself has been organized for you. We are, of course, joined online by some wonderful volunteers from the departments whose heads have just welcomed you all. And they are serving as online rapporteurs. They will be in the closing session, helping to give a few points from each of the panels so that those who had to make tough choices between uh, trade investment law versus um, nature-based solutions or climate repair versus climate litigation are actually able to still hear the flavor of what went on in the whole conference as a whole. We would like to especially encourage the chairs and speakers of the session to work with your rapporteurs to ensure that their summaries, just three bullet points each, are as meaningful as possible to represent your discussion over the next couple of days. Alongside, you have further volunteers who have joined you as your online moderators. They will be especially ensuring that all of the 800 plus people who have chosen to join us as registrants in different parts of this conference, depending in part on their time zone, understandably, will be able to participate as much as possible in the conference. They will be waiting and watching online and ensuring that the questions that come forward are brought forward to the chair and the speakers, and also especially recognizing the people from many different countries who have joined us, many universities around the world, but also practitioners, senior government officials, lawyers, judges, and others who are joining us now and will be joining us in the next five events. We will, as you know, as soon as this opening plenary concludes, go straight into the actual substantive panels, which are a mix of world leading practitioners who are going to be delivering some opening remarks and chairing the sessions, world leading researchers and scholars and professors as well, together with early career and emerging scholars who have competed for the opportunity to present their papers today and have been successful. And for this, I congratulate all of them. We are especially looking forward to two panels held at the same time from 2 till 3.15 British Standard Time, um, one on climate ambition through trade regimes and one on conservation pathways and climate action. 
we're then going to have a short health break and we'll go back together for a session on climate and the wealth economy and another session on corporate climate engagement and regulation. It's going to be a tough choice for those who are watching online of which sessions they will be choosing to attend. We'll be joining all of us together um, for the closing plenary for this day, which has been placed across two days in order to allow those from many time zones to participate. The Climate Law and Practice Plenary it's co-hosted with a new organization that I've been very, very fortunate to be deeply involved in co-founding, the Net Zero Lawyers Alliance, with leading practitioners from around the world and especially from leading firms here in London who have mobilized themselves and will be talking to you about the emerging practice of climate law. There we will also be launching a new fireside chat series for you who are considering careers in this area to have a chance to talk to leading practitioners of climate law over the next year. We're doing that together with the University of Oxford and also with the University of London. And we're really looking forward to the continuing beyond COP um, discussions of potential career pathways for all of you. We'll have a very brief closing plenary for the day. It, we don't want to run too late, but we have fortunately keynote speakers, including Justice Antonio Benjamin of the National High Court of Brazil, who founded the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment and has been a very, very present uh, force of nature himself for many years in our community, together with Dr. David Boyd, who's the UN Rapporteur for Human Rights and the Environment, and has just, with thousands and thousands of others, secured legal recognition of the right to a clean environment in the United Nations most recently. At that session, we'll present the conference prizes for the best online presentations, all of which are available as videos online at the moment um, for you to watch in breaks or when you feel like it, and also the best conference posters. And here I would like to especially recognize Dr. Alexandra Harrington from the CISDL and the University of Albany, who has been chairing a group of very distinguished judges that have been looking at these and judging them over the coming days. The final best paper of the conference will, of course, be presented. Um, the award will be presented in the closing plenary because we will want to watch all of your papers be delivered before we try to choose between you. On Saturday morning, we will be joined again by, um, well, Dr. Marcus Gehring, together with Justice Antonio Benjamin, who are chairing a plenary opening at 9.30 British Standard Time on international law and public policy innovations in the Paris Agreement. There, my co-chair for this session and my co-chair for the closing session, I'm in Chukawi, together with other leading negotiators and scholars, will be presenting some of the key issues that are at stake in this COP and how they've become such key issues and where they might go. So tune in there for a real clear picture of what exactly is happening in international law on the Paris Agreement. And uh, I will recognize especially Professor Christina Voigt, who is going to be our expert speaking about the Compliance Committee, which makes sense. Um, finally, there'll be two more parallel panels, one on climate justice and human rights that will be um, taking place from 10.30 to 11.45 British Standard Time, and one on frameworks for climate repair, governing new climate technologies and carbon negative development, which is, of course, co-chaired by our Center for Climate Chair Repair here in Cambridge, and Dr. Antoinetta Nestor, who's online. In the closing plenary, we have one more closing keynote speaker, and we're also joined by a video which has been kindly um, uh, being explored to be sent by our UK climate champions. Um, the leader coordinator has been incredibly kind to assist us with this, and also the hosts of the Glasgow Climate Law and Governance Day, um, Dr. Jerzy uh, Jokubowskaite, and also um, representing, of course, our colleagues from Class Kide, um, uh, Professor. Um, Dr. Francesco Sindico um, and uh, Rebecca Williams and Michael Mailing and Henry Lovett. Those two universities are co-hosting us in Glasgow next Friday, so they'll give you a bit of a taste of what's to come. Um, we will especially want to thank our judges and we will especially want to encourage everyone to be um, right on time for their plenaries and their sessions because we will be starting them on the hour or on the time in the program. Speaking of which, I'm going to thank everybody who has spoken here, especially thank all of our partners across the University of Cambridge, who together with 
the Glasgow University and the University of Strathclyde, the Centre for International Sustainable Development Law, the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, and all of the wonderful sponsors, not the least Dentons and Sidley, as well as many of our colleagues who have come forward from the law journals and the leading presses and to make this conference possible. So thank you to all of you, and I look forward to seeing you in the upcoming substantive experts panels that follow. Thank you.